Okay, let's continue with the message uh, picture. Professor Juan Chen, thank you for coming. He, he is at the University of Tennessee, and he's now a professor in the Colorado State University in Fort Collins. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rafael, and uh, Renato, for inviting me here. I would say this is uh, probably the most important workshop I have participated in in recent years. Oh. Yeah, so hopefully my talk can uh, be entertained in the next one hour. Uh, so the uh, my main task for this talk today is to try to convince you that uh, uh, in addition to skin, uh, probably multiple moments is uh, another interesting and measurable uh, physical quantity that uh, we should uh, think about more often in this matter of physics. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. I will give you a brief introduction, then I to uh, tell you how we got involved in this uh, topic, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, the main work that this talk is about, uh, how you can think about the transport of this uh, uh, unconditional quantity physical object on multiple moments in thermal matter uh, systems, in electronic systems. And then I will talk about some uh, uh, ramifications of uh, this uh, uh, work. One is uh, actually before uh, the first week, uh, how one can possibly understand the uh, open talk about the effect in uh, transport phenomena as a uh, different response, response of magnetic portable moment to electric uh, field. And finally, I'll talk about uh, uh, how uh, you, know, you can define the transport of multiple moment and uh, how can understand the multiple moment of a, a system in equilibrium. So, a well defined theory for uh, computing that uh, quantitatively. That's uh, the task of the uh, topic. So, uh, as an introduction, we uh, got interested in this topic uh, from our uh, several projects related to non-collinear magnetism in general. Uh, you probably have seen this uh, picture in some of uh, places. Uh, the usual magnetism is uh, easy to imagine. You have a uh, magnetic moments attached to magnetic elements uh, pointing along or opposite to a given direction in three-dimensional space. But, uh, in non-collinear uh, magnets, they are not necessarily along or opposite to that direction. And uh, this uh, uh, position-dependent um, orientation um, of the local moments can uh, be in the uh, unit cell scale, or it can be in uh, scales that span many hundreds of unit cells. Uh, but in any case, all of these uh, situations are inherently more uh, Interesting compared to the collinear ones, just more degree of freedom for us or uh, larger parameter space for us to explore. Uh, as far as the first work that uh, we touched upon, uh, that's uh, the anomalous holy site in this uh, um, non collinear on a Bremen night, this the chemical formula NE3X. X can be a non magnetic metal element. And uh, in the first paper that we uh, wrote about this, uh, we consider the material magnets uh, iridium. Iridium are these uh, balls that do not have the uh, arrows attached to them. Um, so our um, conclusion of that work was uh, to uh, basically to say that uh, the anomalous void fact, which was usually thought of as a uh, uh, extension of the void fact, uh, it just replaced the uh, magnetic field by a Magnetization that also has the same symmetry under a time reversal and the rotation. Uh, so that's kind of easy to uh, imagine, at least conceptually. But uh, if uh, there's no such an uh, arrow, such a vector in your system, uh, how do you know which direction the electrons uh, should uh, be deflected if you uh, drive them to flow with a longitudinal uh, electric field? So uh, we basically said that. Uh, the existence of the anomalous void fact is just a, uh, a consequence of symmetry. If uh, you cannot find uh, uh, 
uh, an addict space for loop symmetries that uh, forbids such a response, then uh, nature most often will just make it uh, non zero. If it is non zero, it's, uh, uh, if it is zero, it's accidentally zero, but it cannot be exactly zero. And that's uh, something that can only be dictated by symmetry. So, uh, uh, by the way, this uh, structure, if you look at the individual atomic layers perpendicular to the all that direction, they look like the cogomelitis formed by the enemies uh, atoms. That's another interesting uh, subject that many people in the Minnesota community uh, are interested in. So, uh, uh, following our prediction, uh, in the next year, um, some experimentalists from Japan uh, immediately synthesized a uh, closely related compound, mango 3 tin. It has the same Kagome uh, structure, but uh, they are stacked in a, a, B, a B fashion, not A, B, C fashion, as in the uh, mainly three iridium case. But nonetheless, uh, it, uh, uh, you know, one can argue with the same uh, types of reasoning that uh, if there is no symmetry for beating, the anomalous void factor then should be non-zero. Indeed, they measured the uh, anomalous void factor, uh, which turned out to be very large, a room temperature comparable to that in thermal limits in this compound. And that uh, kind of triggered a, um, a series of uh, uh, experimental and the theoretical uh, studies related to these uh, nonlinear antifermagnets, which we will say call anomalous hole antifermagnets. They are antifermagnets, but they have the anomalous hole effects. Uh, one work that uh, uh, we did with uh, our experimental colleagues was uh, to show uh, the anomalous hole effect in this. Uh, and it's a platinum, which you may recognize as the same uh, crystal and magnetic structure as mainly through the iridium. Uh, but this material is interesting because it has a, this transition between a collinear on the magnetic phase and a non-collinear on the magnetic phase. And you can tune that by changing uh, temperature or strain. They can show that you can switch the uh, anomalous wave effect on and off by uh, basically pushing the system beyond this. Uh, this Phase boundary between the two uh, different underground phases, and finally, in, uh, also following this uh, experimental paper, people found that uh, if you calculate this uh, um, time structure using this functional theory, there are some wild nodes uh, near the Fermi energy. Uh, so people studying wild and Dirac semi-metal physics also got uh, interested in these uh, materials, and this is not a um, exhaustive list. You can probably find other papers by looking at references uh, uh, citing these uh, papers. Uh, but uh, just a digression if uh, you cannot uh, define a uh, vector that looks like magnetization or uh, magnetic field easily, uh, how uh, do you know if your system has a normal square factor or not? Uh, so, this motivated us to construct an uh, indicator. Of the anomalous wave effect um, that is different from magnetization. Uh, the idea is that it has to uh, be well behaved um, in the same way as the total magnetization. It should be translation invariant, it should be gauge invariant, and it should uh, um, satisfy all magnetic space group symmetry of your system. And uh, you can construct such quantities by Considering the gradients of the charge and the spin densities, basically, if you uh, have a construction like this, you can figure out that uh, I mean, if I is a scalar field, it can be the electrostatic potential it can be charge density, and uh, is the uh, magnetization microscopic magnetization field. Uh, such combinations are pseudo vectors, and they change sign and they're time reversal. And because you integrate them over all space, it doesn't depend on the origin, the choice of the origin, or in other words, it's translationally invariant. So these uh, behave in the same way as uh, your magnetization. And you can use this quantities not only to describe how your uh, anomalous wave effect uh, vector will change when you change the, um, the magnetic order of your system, but you can also use them to predict uh, as a Guiding principle: What systems that uh, have a vanishing uh, total magnetization can have an almost void effect? Uh, 
some of them are non-trivial. For example, if you have a so-called Kagome spin eyes that doesn't have a uh, long-range spin order, all the spins average to zero. It's constantly fluctuating in this uh, system. But there is a ice rule that makes uh, spins uh, uh, pointing to a site is uh, non-zero upon average. And uh, in such systems, uh, you can still have a, a non-zero anomalous wave height, which is counterintuitive. Usually, you think it's due to some ordering of the local spins. But uh, we uh, gave the counter example. And also, uh, you can have a normal wave height if you have a magnetic chart uh, that's uh, different from the spermion that uh, many people are you know, you know, familiar with. Magnetic chart is uh, that you have a, a scalarity um, at the center, and all the uh, local magnetization are pointing away uh, from it or into it. Uh, for such a magnetic texture, it's hard to imagine why uh, electrons would favor, um, for example, moving to the left instead of uh, to the right. But uh, uh, if the, you uh, construct your Hamiltonian by requiring it to have these uh, finite quantities, then uh, it can show that there is indeed a uh, anomalous wave effect. Uh, just to show that you can get that by uh, skewed scattering. But there are other mechanisms that uh, can give the anomalous wave effect as well. And basically, uh, this is just the requirement of the symmetry. Uh, just want to show that uh, because the symmetry in this system allows anomalous wave effect to exist. Then, quite easily, you can make it uh, appear in a microscopic model. Um, so, uh, that was uh, the anomalous wave height, which is uh, a, a transport phenomenon of uh, charge. Uh, that's uh, kind of easy to deal with. But uh, uh, then um, we were um, uh, contacted by our experimental colleagues and, uh, uh, who asked us if uh, we can think of transport of spin. In these uh, non-homing Oliver magnets. And these uh, uh, spin transport phenomena also go back uh, in, to the uh, late 90s uh, when people proposed the, the uh, idea of uh, a whole uh, I mean, spin analog of the anomalous wave height, or whole effect in general. Basically, if you have a, a electric charge carriers that also carry spin, and these uh, carriers uh, can be deflected by um, any of the mechanisms that can give you a whole or uh, anomalous wave types. Uh, but there is no uh, magnetic order. Then uh, these uh, spin up and spin down electrons will be deflected to opposite directions. So there is no net charge current, but the uh, spin current is net zero. So you should be able to. Uh, predict a transversely flowing spin current, but there shouldn't be an end here. And what's the consequence of that spin current? Uh, it will lead to transport of spin uh, from one uh, side boundary to the other side boundary, so you have the accumulation of spin with opposite signs at opposite uh, side boundaries. So that's uh, the first uh, uh, prediction of the spin hole effect. But when you have such a direct phenomena, you can consider it reciprocal. Namely, if you inject a spin, pure spin current, uh, just imagine this process happens reversely in your mind, in your mind that should trigger a flow of the uh, uh, charge current in the transverse directions. This is the uh, so called inverse point. Uh, uh, after that, people thought that uh, if, you, if this is a, a useful way to create a pure spin current, then let's use it for other things. Uh, in the early days of spintronics, uh, people used a thermagnetic layer to filter out uh, spins uh, um, with uh, a alignment different from a thermagnetic modulation. This is uh, called the uh, spin valve or spin filter, and that's uh, uh, what people initially uh, used to create pure spin current and that can be used to manipulate uh, uh, the magnetization of uh, a softer magnet that uh, uh, this current is injected to. But uh, if you can create spin current in this manner, you can uh, imagine that you just uh, place it on top of another paramagnet and uh, let the spin current flow into it, the magnetization of the paramagnet should, should respond to the spin current that uh, creates some functionalities, some device uh, designs. 
So these are nice, but to, um, to us who uh, just walk into this field uh, as a uh, novice, the, uh, the, the biggest problem to us is that just means not a conserved quantity. Uh, it's quite different from charge. Uh, spin operator doesn't commute with the, uh, your uh, measure of Hamiltonian uh, at all because uh, there is always a spin over coupling. Spin over coupling can become a much larger in even higher systems than that in very actual in vacuum. Um, as a result, you do not have a continuity equation for the density of spin. And because of that, uh, there's no ambiguous way to introduce a current of the spin. If uh, your spin density changes locally, um, it's not necessary, not necessary because of uh, it's being carried into that region or out of that region, the current. It's, uh, it can just be created out of nowhere uh, locally because it's not a conservative quantity. So uh, how to think of this problem, uh, what uh, uh, occurred to us then was uh, to avoid using the concept of spin current. So we uh, uh, thought that probably, I mean, the experiment what you measure is the accumulation of spin with uh, opposite signs and opposite side boundaries. So maybe we can just define spin flow effect as uh, the local response of spin density to electric field. Um, and this uh, indeed works, and then you can arrive at uh, uh, the same phenomenology as uh, the spin flow effect as uh, predicted by using the spin current language. Uh, but more important, uh, this quantity can be ambiguously uh, computed. But uh, yeah, that's the idea. If you just cover what, um, pretend that there's nothing flowing, and just to think about the consequences. Uh, but then this led us to um, um, uh, basically a uh, uh, phenomenon that was uh, originally not discussed in the spin point type literature, uh, namely this response function uh, doesn't uh, require uh, particularly time reversal symmetry breaking. You can have uh, uh, this uh, response without and also symmetry breaking in the ground state. That's why it's important to exist uh, in non-magnetic systems. But this also means if you have a magnetic system, there should be something more. There, is, uh, there should be a part in this response function that uh, changes sign under uh, and result. That's uh, uh, what we call the uh, magnetic spin point effect. Um, it, uh, can lead to spin accumulation with a different pattern compared to the, uh, the uh, original spin point effect, for which the spins are all uh, in plane on these side walls, but now you can have them pointing out of the plane. Um, our experimental colleagues uh, did the experiments in this non-collinear uh, ferromagnet just to, as a proof of principle. And they, they indeed found that uh, the spin accumulation they measured at the side boundaries change sign when they change the magnetic order uh, or they did time reversal in this uh, uh, material. So that's kind of uh, satisfying to some degree, but, uh, um, but there is uh, still this dilemma that uh, uh, comes back to us uh, from time to time. Uh, on the one hand, spin is not a conserved quantity, so it's uh, not I mean, the, the discussion of uh, uh, spin transport using spin currents is... I have a question. Can you uh, explain the experimental um, observations just using a combination of the anomalous Hall effect and this spin Hall effect that are combining this magnetic spin Hall effect that you... Yeah, so we're not the... Uh, uh, first uh, uh, people to talk about this uh, um, magnetic version of the uh, spin point effect. Uh, you can perfectly use the spin current language to talk about the same response. Um, in that case, you can, uh, if you want to talk about the spin accumulation, you can uh, describe it as a two-step process. First, uh, there is a spin current due to the the bulk version of the 
uh, and then spin point time to flowing to the boundary, and then there is a accumulation of that uh, of the spin carried by that that spin current at the boundary. So it's a two-step process. Uh, those uh, uh, so the first part, the bulk response, is uh, is alluded to in this paper. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, the basically uh, as long as you know what you are uh, measuring. Can arrive at uh, the same conclusion regardless of uh, which language you use. But uh, the thing is, uh, can you always compute something that can be directly measured? Yeah. So, uh, so we basically followed this route in the beginning, and uh, although we avoid uh, avoided using spin current language, um, we still feel that uh, the community doesn't uh, accept this uh, uh, formulation because uh, the spin current is such a convenient tool. Uh, you, can, uh, you can easily imagine how um, currents flow across different materials and that uh, can uh, allow you to design new uh, devices, new geometry, without uh, thinking too hard on the fine details of your system. So we want to uh, exploit this aspect of the uh, spin transport, but uh, we thought that um, I mean, if such a, such a language, although not perfect, not exact, is useful, can we uh, go further? Why should we stop at the level of the transport of spin? Can we think of a transport of uh, some quantity that is inherently then conserved, as long as uh, uh, it can lead to new predictions of the measurable phenomena. Uh, very useful. This is uh, our motivation of uh, studying the transport of uh, magnetic moments, magnetic multiple moments. Um, this is done uh, by my former postdoc, Mohamed Tahir. Uh, in practice, this uh, concept is also attractive because uh, uh, in recent years, people got more and more interested in uh, complex magnetic structures in kinetic matter physics. We know in classical uh, electrodynamics, if you have a inhomogeneity of your charge of spin or magnetization distributions, it's uh, quite uh, uh, routinary to do a multiple expansion and to uh, use higher order multiples to uh, talk about characteristic spatial dependence. Uh, this led to the uh, quite uh, prevailing discussions of uh, complex magnetic structures in terms of these uh, low order multiple moments. One example is a toroidal moment. You can imagine that these uh, spins form a uh, circle in the unit cell. They point, uh, they point head to tail. Um, so that uh, you can uh, imagine there is a non-zero uh, spin cross-product uh, position of the uh, moments. That's uh, just the one component of uh, the uh, portable moment of spin. Uh, for the 93x compounds that we just uh, looked at, uh, you can use uh, uh, simple arguments to see why it should have uh, octuple moments. The, it's an underground magnet, so the dipole moment vanishes. It has the uh, inversion symmetry, so it shouldn't have any portable moment. The lowest order, non zero, uh, multiple moment should be multiple. Uh, so, the, uh, uh, what we want to, uh, to motivate the community to think about is uh, um, these uh, multiple order, because they uh, do not have a dipole order, they do not couple to uniform magnetic fields. And make, makes them, in general, hard to manipulate using conventional ways of, of spin tronics. You can just use magnetic fields to change the orientation of the magnetic order. But uh, uh, we have learned from, from spin tronics, in order to manipulate uh, ferromagnet, you don't necessarily need a magnetic field, you can use the currents carrying that to quantum number of spin. So uh, if we can engineer a current that can carry multiple moments, we can use that to manipulate Systems with the multiple order. That's the, uh, the, uh, the basic argument. So, uh, but on the other hand, one can uh, probably get something more from this. If uh, 
um, in, in um, recent years, there's a, a actual community talking about uh, uh, local uh, PLP models that have a, a non-trivial uh, physical properties and the topology, like the uh, graphene, transfer model, dash coordinates, etc. Uh, those uh, places in the momentum space where you can locally define a um, uh, parabolic or linear Hamiltonian, uh, you can ask what uh, uh, interesting physical properties they have. Uh, in the case of uh, transition metal batch coordinates, you can know that there are uh, well defined orbital magnetic moments, as well as spin, as well as uh, uh, turn number at each body. But uh, uh, with these definitions of higher order uh, magnetic multiple moments, one can ask if you can uh, define or uh, have these valid materials that can host these uh, multiple moments. And uh, if, uh, um, if they have, you can use light, for example, just selectively excite charge carriers in these uh, uh, valleys and uh, induce nine equilibrium uh, multiple moments. So uh, hopefully that can get people interested in this topic. But uh, then the question is uh, how to uh, define multiple moments in general. Multiple moments uh, uh, is a notoriously uh, uh, you defined property. In classical uh, inertial dynamics, you probably know that uh, uh, if uh, uh, your system doesn't have a, a, a zero uh, charge, a net charge, then its uh, stable moment is uh, U-defined. It depends on the choice of the region. Uh, so these kind of difficulties are something that we have to overcome uh, later. But, uh, uh, but even for the definition of the multiple moments, there are several definitions uh, in the classical uh, textbooks of electrodynamics for some William Jackson. But this is a definition that we feel uh, is the most uh, closely connected to uh, electronic structure theory in this matter physics. Um, uh, basically, if uh, you have a um, um, interaction uh, between your charge densities and uh, a external field or potential, uh, this is uh, a snapshot of uh, uh, electrodynamics by console electrodynamics by Jackson. Uh, chapter four, um, if you do a pair expansion of uh, your um, electrostatic potential about uh, region zero uh, and finish the integral in space, uh, the coefficients of uh, the, um, this uh, power order derivatives of the uh, Electrostatic potential would be what we call the uh, multiple moments. In other words, uh, the multiple moments are observables. They are conjugate fields, or conjugate uh, observables, or variables to higher order gradients of the uh, potential uh, close to them. So, um, so this is fine for a uh, given finite system in equilibrium. But uh, our goal is to talk about transport of multiple moments. And that's another level of difficulty. You know, how can you even come up with a well defined sense of transport of this thing that is in a hard to, to uh, define in uh, ground state or in equilibrium? This led us to the idea of uh, uh, defining multiple moments for individual electrons. Uh, this uh, uh, sense of uh, attaching. Um, Qualities of different structure to individual electrons started in the early days of quantum mechanics. For example, uh, people can understand how, why uh, single Dirac electrons can have a, a dipole moment by uh, constructing a wave packet of uh, Dirac electrons and uh, compute the uh, orbital magnetization of such a wave packet. This uh, is uh, described in this, uh, in this paper in 1932. Um, so uh, the first idea that came to us was, uh, uh, OK, can you just uh, do it for block electrons, but for multiple moments? We have a well-defined uh, multiple moment operator. If you have a uh, local um, system, a finite system, uh, it came from the classical definition of the multiple moments. It's to replace this uh, spin density by a, uh, a spin density operator and uh, do the finish the integral overall space. Form of the uh, the operator form of the multiple moments. 
And then you can compute its uh, expectation value uh, for a web package state. Um, and uh, because we have a web packet that has a well-defined center of mass position, we can, uh, what you usually do is to um, define your position operator relative to the center of mass position, and that turned out to work for the original uh, magnetic battle moment of spin uh, of uh, direct electrons. Uh, so we tried this, but uh, the formula you got is, uh, uh, has a lot of typological properties. It's uh, not invariant under uh, uh, gauge transformation, and uh, it's also not invariant under change of uh, your wave packet shape, which is unacceptable. But such difficulties will not arise for uh, no order uh, multiple movements, like typo, but they will generally exist for higher order multiple movements. So the first. Uh, 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 so, Ian, what, what is the reason for that? Like why is a quadrupole moment so much more problematic than a dipole moment? Yeah, you can. Uh, I mean, if I just think of like classical charges, you know, like a you know positive negative charge or like two positive two negative charges. I mean, it, like if I draw a picture on the blackboard, it doesn't seem like there's yeah a on, more the classical, with it. on the classical level, there's a, uh, these uh, properties would not arise, but now we are uh, talking about uh, multiple movement uh, multiple movement of a construct. We pack it. How you construct the wave packet will affect the property that you you're calculating, mm -hmm. or the shape of the wave packet. If it is a dipole moment, it's uh, I mean there's not so much degree of freedom that, that it can change its dipole moment. Yes. But uh, if you distort the wave packet shape uh, in a not very symmetrical way, it will lead to all higher order multiple moments to appear. The dipole moment. Uh, it's easier because uh, you can uh, pass the shape. Yeah. You can pass this uh, function w, uh, which will appear here uh, from right to left uh, easily. And the final product is just uh, this w squared that basically means you're, uh, you're picking the value at uh, the central mass of the wave packet, so uh, that drops off. Okay, so it's like the phase information of W is not important. Uh, the phase is also important. Phase basically uh, leads to phase generis, uh, phase dependence, but the phase of the W will be removed by this procedure for the dipole moment. Okay. But this procedure doesn't work for higher order multiple moments. Okay, I see. That's the right question. Yeah. Are you constraining yourself to a given band? And there is space yeah. to be one. Good question. We are uh, only considering single bands in this uh, work, non degenerate bands. It can be generalized to degenerate bands that we're working on. And what appears to me is like you're considering the multiple moments within the distribution of that wave function. Yeah. yeah. So this. Uh, uh, Waiting function w is uh, uh, peaked in momentum space. As long as it has a finite width, it will also lead to a finite width in real space. So it has uh, both by defined the central mass position uh, in momentum space and central mass position in real space. And so, so one final question. Uh, so if, if you constrain yourself to a particular band, then there will be some. Uh, High symmetry representation associated with that band. Yeah. Right. But you're saying I can form a weight packet you know, that involves, you know, you're, you're not constrained with that uh, internal structure. You're more looking at a more coarse grain spreading of that weight packet. Yeah. So uh, that's also a good point. In principle, you can uh, require your weighting function to be compatible with uh, the symmetry at that particular hit point, uh, Hc. But uh, we are not uh, enfor enforcing that constraint. Uh, our only requirement is that this does not, uh, um, this is uh, moderately localized in both the uh, momentum space and real space. But uh, at this level, the uh, final product is uh, still problematic. It's not uh, 
dating your own holiday. So, uh, what we did uh, in the first part of the paper was uh, to identify a dating your uh, party of uh, that one for one uh, So, basically, there is uh, a error uh, connection that is uh, subtracted from the derivative for uh, each component of the multiple moment. And you can show that this is a gate invariant, and uh, uh, also it allows the wave package shape to pass from one side to the other. Uh, so in the end, you still use the argument that if the wave package shape function is localized in k space, it just kicks out the central mass momentum in the final uh, equation and doesn't change other things. Uh, Basically, finish the passing of the repetitive shape by using this uh, identity. Uh, so, this is my approach. Uh, you essentially started from the prob problematic uh, formula and asked what would be the most compact way to get rid of uh, new terms that arises when you do a transformation of, of the repetitive shape. This is uh, what you can do. Uh, another way, which uh, can be uh, more heuristic. Is uh, um, instead of uh, you know, uh, the, the main problem with this uh, procedure of uh, removing uh, center of isolation from the uh, position operator is uh, um, the center of mass uh, uh, momentum of a web packet is well defined because we just encoded in the uh, shape function. But the center of mass position is not really well defined. There is uh, a dependence on gauge transformation. So if, but if you can introduce central mass position from the central mass momentum that would uh, help us get rid of uh, or circumvent uh, that problem. And this can be done if you re-quantize this uh, center class of variables, central mass position and central mass crystal momentum. Uh, the, 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 the tool you need is uh, explained in this work. Um, basically, if you use uh, uh, central mass, uh, the uh, re-quantized Central mass uh, position operator in the uh, definition of the multiple moment here, you will arrive at uh, the same point. So, question So, what are uh, is A the very connection? Yeah. What is little g and f? So, this is a general identity. Uh, so, A here, it's not necessarily the very, very connection, so, uh, we just throw it in here. Uh, so, because it appears in the uh, original um, um, original expression, the uh, key is that uh, with uh, these terms, uh, you can pass g from right to, to the left, regardless of whether you have an a here. So what a is, is unimportant. Okay, but, um, let's talk about physically, what is the quantity g and f? Uh, g, f is the wave function, g is uh, the wave packet shape. So a gauge transformation on the wave function can also be uh, absorbed by G. So G both includes the, um, the, the information of the um, phase of the wave function and also how uh, the wave function, the amplitude of the wave, the wave function, the, how the amplitude of the uh, wave packet shape, wave packet wave function depends on K. And that's it. But that you have that partial with respect to x. Yeah, so this so, is a, a simple uh, version of that uh, so like formula. Like a general when example? When you, when you, when you just consider all the spatial components of the multiple moments are along the same direction. But so you can generalize this to uh, different components. And in that case, there's a uh, problem of non commuting of the different. Uh, Components directed with respect to different directions, and you have to do a uh, summarization. This is a, this is a summation over all um, um, in equivalent uh, directions or connections of these uh, spatial directions. So, uh, but, let, but I, I'm just trying to understand that equation. So that partial with respect to x, that's the real space, or is that case of x? Case of x. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to understand why you're subtracting this very connection term. Um, 
So if I if I take an equally weighted um, superposition of all the states within a band, right, then the very phase uh, will tell me where the center of that wave packet is going to be. Right? Yeah, but uh, and so essentially what you're saying is um, the same is true if the weights are not equally. Just the spreading of the, the just the spreading of the wave packet, I guess. Can I think it out? If you're subtracting the center of matter, essentially you're subtracting the one center. So you're saying the wave packet because it's a superposition within a particular band, it will inherit the center of mass given by the very face. Yeah, but very face is a is a unifying the point. It's a what? It's a unifying the point that you got a different value of it by doing a arbitrary independent uh, gauge transformation. Yeah, but the, that just maps to a uh, different unit cell. But modular unit cell, you know, it tells you where the one is, right? But, uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, just trying to think, like, subtracting the center of mass of the wave packet is yeah. essentially, so, that, that's why you're so, subtracting. Uh, the, the, the problem is more uh, severe. If uh, you can do gauge transformations in a way that uh, it, it basically change the wave packet shape. Uh, in other words, uh, you, uh, you have a uh, you have a some gauge transformation that shifts x component uh, by one unit cell, y component by one unit cell, and that leads to a different uh, multiple moment. So that's uh, why it affects the value of the multiple moment, even if uh, you subtracting the Every connection on that. You have to do something more other than just by subtracting a fixed error connection. But this is, I, is this for a system with, can I think of this as a system on the torus? Or uh, every unit cell is equivalent up to some translation? Um, I mean, it's uh, inherently uh, the same as. Uh, Free electrons. The, the system only knows what uh, the information near a K point. <coughs> it's a wave packet. Uh, so you only need a, a PLP Hamiltonian near that K point to fully describe that uh, wave packet. Yeah, so that's what I was trying to understand. So let me then ask why are we subtracting the full very phase, another weighted very phase where you have? Only the components of U and K that are involved in the wave packet. Yeah, that's a, a good uh, point. Um, so, uh, in, uh, basically, that's what this is. So, that uh, this RC is just uh, the uh, error connection at KC, a fixed value. But if you allow derivative to act on it, Act on that error connection, then it will carry uh, information of the wave function away from uh, KC. I see. That's uh, essentially why this AJ uh, or this error connection is not taking value at KC directly. You first expand the whole thing and then make K equal to KC. This, this is not what is called the covariant derivative <laughs> in old fashioned terms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Easy, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. No buttons. <laughs> yeah. That you just basically that's fix so, the anomaly by putting the gauge term. Yeah, basically that's what what it is. Okay. But uh, <laughs> the, the question is why you should use a uh, covariant derivative in the first place. I mean it's if you from Jagman's theory because it's not correct, it's not gauge invariant in this equation, so you put it and then you make it gauge invariant. Yeah. Just have a question. You're, you assume that your banner functions are localized always for this to be. It's. I mean, there there's no one-year functions really. But the, what is your? I mean, your W is integrated over the band, right? So is it is that not the definition of banner function? Uh, oh, okay. In this. Yes. Um. Yes. Uh, that's. Uh, so is, is your W not? Do you assume that it's always localized? Yeah, uh, so for one year function, you have a, a uh, constant w. Right? This uh, w depends on k. It's uh, artificially chosen so that it's localized in the space. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, no, I was just going to add because, for example, there's some results that say that what's equivalent to having a non trivial turn number is an obstruction to having a complete basis of Banyer functions that are localized or something like that. Yeah, so, so I don't know if that would affect, in some cases, your the expected value of your, if it would be well defined. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm okay. not too worried about that because okay. I'm not uh, really dealing with the Banyer functions. And the, the way packet is always in an open uh, proper environment, they have this famous picture of the web packet spanning many uh, unit cells. We're talking about the semi-classical okay. uh, objects. So uh, now that you you have a uh, age invariant and shape invariant quantity that is attached to each monophase action, you can use your semi-classical sense of the uh, transport to uh, talk about the the transport of such a quantity by uh, interactions. So uh, combine uh, such a uh, formula with uh, the simplest possible uh, semi classical Boltzmann equation. And uh, this will be your first version of the transport equations describing the uh, relation of the either a uniform density of multiple moments or a uniform uh, current that carries uh, multiple moments. Basically, by the transport of the individual electrons. Uh, this picture is uh, what uh, we're going to talk about next. It's a prototypical example of the transport of the um, This is a, a model layer uh, phosphorus, black phosphorus. It's a, a honeycomb lattice if you, if you do not consider the buckling. When there is buckling, you look at it from the top. The unit cell has the four uh, key atoms, and the unit cell has a uh, rectangular shape. Uh, this rectangular, rectangular shape motivated us to think of uh, 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 octuple moments of spin, which has uh, two position uh, operators. Uh, if you have a multiple moment with uh, x, y index, you can imagine that it will lead to a pattern of uh, Minus plus plus minus in a rectangular sample. This is uh, the original motivation that got us uh, uh, interested in this particular uh, material. So uh, we want to see if it has uh, these uh, uh, multiple moments of the uh, block electrons that have some uh, different regions in the momentum space. But uh, if you just uh, use this material by itself, uh, uh, all of the answers are to generate because it has an uh, inversion of time reversal symmetries. Uh, so uh, we um, uh, consider a all the plane electric field that can break the inversion symmetry, so all the bands become uh, non degenerate, and th this is the uh, band structure. And uh, this all the plane electric field also sleep speeds the uh, the and the beta sense in a way that there are two uh, valleys uh, very close to the gamma point of the Brillouin zone. We can ask if there are multiple moments, multiple uh, optical moments in, in particular at these uh, valley centers. So we used uh, our uh, formula to uh, calculate that uh, um, optical moments and found that uh, they are indeed uh, generally non zero. Uh, these are the two uh, components that. Uh, We're interested in. Uh, we have off diagonal spatial uh, components, and the, the spin components, which are the superscripts, are uh, can be along x or y. Um, and uh, when, uh, because these quantities depend on the difference of the uh, energies between uh, different bands at the same k, uh, they will be very large when uh, the two bands are near near the degenerate. So that's why near the center of the uh, are so large to be too large to be plotted in this uh, what, network. What is Vx to Ln in this formula? That's the velocity operator. Uh, like the state Ln, Ln. Ln. Uh, yeah, are the labeling of the two bands. Spin hole conductance formula in some of these guys. Uh, so for spin four, you have a, yeah, a spin, a velocity, and a velocity. But the spin four connectivity has, a, let's see, uh, Yeah, 
that's different to uh, the combinations. Because you're not taking the trace of the variable. Um, you're just taking the combinations. It doesn't matter. Um, but it's, uh, it's different. So this is a, by the way, this is just the one term in that formula. If you fully expand that formula, there are many other terms. They all have uh, uh, some combination of the spin uh, and uh, the whole operators. Some uh, some of them are diagonal in band indices. Some of, some of them are off diagonal. It just it turns out that in this particular model at the, uh, the center of the valley, only this term survives. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you know that uh, these uh, multiple movements appear in the space, you can uh, have all the signs at opposite uh, sides of the Bernard dome. Uh, I mean, it's easy to imagine if you apply an actual field that has a make this to a staggered uh, distribution, uh, then you can make them at zero. Uh, so this is the, the formula of the Senate House of uh, uh, my equilibrium the multiple moment created by uh, the actual field. This is uh, with the integrand. It has the uh, um, opposite contributions from two near degenerate bands in the, uh, the Fermi energy. So after summing this, uh, integrating this uh, over the Bernard zone, the final number is uh, not large, but still it's, uh, um, uh, it will lead to a observable uh, consequence. If you have a optional moment of spin, it means that uh, you should have this pattern of uh, uh, spin accumulation. If you look at uh, the four corners of uh, your rectangular sample or, or square sample, you should be able to measure spin densities or uh, local spin after integrating over the, uh, the corner. It should be basically the plus minus of the, the uh, optical moment. How would you measure the spin density? Uh, measure the spin. This is not density, it's the integrated spin. Okay, so how would you uh, measure the integrated spin? Uh, experimentally, people in originally measured the uh, spin conversion and spin point fact by using a uh, middle optical curve fact locally, looking at the edge of the, the square sample. Um, so you have opposite uh, curve patient hash zones measurements? Uh, probably. Okay. And that's one way. Another way is uh, to measure the uh, local magnetic field by using some local probes, such as. Uh, Nowadays, people can use the measure of vacancy center. It's a sensitive uh, local magnetic field probe. So, but this would only, so this would be present when the current is present. So, if you switch it off, there's going to be some relaxation time and this bit would sure. optical or moment goes away. There's another way you can excite some uh, charge carriers locally by using light. If there are, uh, there are two valleys, so the light will selectively excite uh, carriers in just the one valley, and that's uh, the different uh, relaxation time of the observed light. And then what is like the localization scale, or what sets the localization scale? It's hard to say. It's, then, it's hard to say. This is uh, a semi-classical physics, so first of all, it must be um, much larger than the lattice scale, and also it depends on how uh, quickly this uh, um, uh, let's do this. It basically, you cannot uh, really predict it without uh, doing the calculation in a finite sample. So, but in this kind of picture that you've drawn here, the spin around the corner, so if the Within this quasi classical approximation, it's going to be spread over many lattice sites. Yeah. So it's like, is that a spin one half moment for the red, or what is the total magnitude of the spin that's accumulated there? Yeah. So basically, the, this response coefficient, m divided by e, if you know how much your uh, actual field is, then this tells you the multiple moment. And then multiple moment is exactly the size of the corner of the spin. This is a, okay, so it's proportional to E. So if you increase E, then you would yeah, increase the spin. Okay. Okay. The so it's some kind of, but it's a macroscopic amount. It's not like H bar. No, no, no. But it's many H bars. Right. Okay. So, yeah. 
dependency is possible to measure. I was thinking sure. it's just no, like no, no. spin one half spread over many unit cells, but your chance of measuring that is going to be very small. <laughs> yeah. I'm out of time. Yeah, you have. Yeah, I mean, no, you have time. Is this for a single layer? Yeah, this is a single layer, but the key is uh, uh, this is uh, uh, existent as long as you have the symmetry that allows it to happen. So if you have a multi-layer black phosphorus, it's not, not a problem. It will still be there. And you, if you have twisted? As long as uh, it has uh, the right symmetry, then it should also be there. Probably it would be more difficult to Larger than the spin cone effect, for example, if you have the mixing bond effect in the sample, how do you distinguish between the same? Yeah, so this is basically what this slide is about. Uh, the, when you break inversion symmetry, there is a uh, Generation of a uh, uniform spin density when you pass the electric field. That's a uh, Rushbach Edelstein effect. Uh, but you can find that uh, after a semi analysis, that this spin density is, is along a different direction. This is along Y. And you can also do the semi analysis for portable movement created by the same electric field in this strong Z. And the only this Octopal moment equation is like along x. Um, yeah, so uh, if you want to learn more about these uh, symmetry tools, at the summer school last year, some, some of your students went there. Uh, you can still find uh, the lecture notes uh, on our website. Uh, yeah, so let me skip the second part and just to tell you the main idea. Uh, if, uh, uh, if you are not satisfied with the boundary picture of the uh, reformulating spin hoi effect, you can uh, imagine that if you connect these uh, two boundaries by modifying the position uh, operator between them, this looks like a dipole moment for spin. In other words, it's a magnetic uh, portable moment. So you can Alternatively, I describe a uh, uh, spin hoi effect as a response of uh, uh, magnetic portable moment to electric field. Um, that's uh, the basic idea, and what uh, it uh, um, what are the benefits? It can allow us to describe the uh, spin hoi effect in uh, non topological but uh, insulating systems. You have a magnetic insulator, in particular. This response is generally non zero as long as it is allowed by symmetry. So, this is a, a, a one version of the KMV model that we considered to reveal such a phenomenon. But uh, we chose this model just because uh, we want to explore its connection with the spin wave factor, the original form of the spin wave factor. But as long as uh, you have a, um, uh, a model with the right symmetry, Uh, there, there is a reciprocal response. If you um, are able to engineer a gradient of the Zeeman field, if you apply that to your system that you know have this response, then you should be able to measure a uh, charge um, voltage or polarization. Um, yeah, the last part is uh, basically the other side of the story. If uh, you have a way to um, discuss transport of multiple moments. Can you also uh, describe the multiple moments of the system in equilibrium um, quantitatively? This uh, was these, uh, what these modern theories of uh, polarization like quantities uh, uh, are about. Uh, so basically, you know all of these other domains should have a, a higher order multiple moments, but if you ask uh, anyone, how large are these multiple movements? No one can tell you. Uh, this has not been formally discussed quantitatively, but discussed uh, in, in physics. 
with just a very uh, few exceptions. Show you the reference. Yeah, the modern theories of uh, polarization quantities are basically to uh, use different ways to encode in the information at the boundary to the uh, block wave functions in the bulk. Uh, that uh, translates to, uh, in some work, um, you can define uh, this polarization like quantities by the response of, uh, a, uh, of the density of free energy to different order gradients of uh, the conjugate fields. So using this point of view, you can define a higher order spin like magnetic multiple moments in general as a, a response of your spin energy uh, density to um, higher order gradients of uh, the sigma field. And uh, this is a general formula that looks like a linear response, which is indeed a linear response. Uh, you can translate that to uh, more manageable formulas for model or DFT calculations. Uh, this is portable, this is optical. For uh, optical moments in particular, many of the quantities here have already been uh, considered in the literature of uh, nonlinear response. Right. So, with. so people have already formulated uh, the DFT calculations of these uh, matrix elements. It's a core function, uh, geometry dependent quantities. So our uh, collaborator, Professor Wang Fu, uh, uh, has already implemented uh, these formulas in uh, DFT, in his DFT code, but uh, we're um, understanding the results, but then show the results here. Instead, uh, this is a, a toy model example that we can uh, uh, do as a sanity check. Basically, if you construct the model with uh, the same assumption as 9310, and uh, you can Get a band structure and uh, uh, plot the integrand of the multiple moment, uh, optical moment along the same asymmetry line. And you do the integration over the Bernard zone, you can get to all, uh, some non zero components of the multiple moment. Uh, you can compare that with the uh, straightforward symmetry analysis that you can get from this uh, very useful field ball symmetry server that some of you are familiar with. And you can see that uh, the non zero components are exactly check with each other, so this is a good entity check. We're indeed calculating quantity that uh, is quite uh, the correct assumption. So uh, there are some uh, possible physical observables that you can uh, try to use to measure uh, multiple moments. Uh, one way is to measure the uh, multiple field created by a finite sample, a sphere sample, that is placed some distance away. And this is uh, one of the earliest efforts um, in trying to uh, measure multiple moments in this manner. It's uh, the uh, quadrupole magnetic field of uh, chromium oxide. Uh, that uh, the prediction of uh, uh, having this quadrupole magnetic field is, was made by Jaszczynski. It was uh, subsequently measured in this uh, paper. Uh, but uh, you cannot really use this to measure the optical field because uh, that will uh, have another 10 to the minus 7 uh, or magnitude uh, change. It's too tiny to, uh, to do it. Uh, but uh, uh, alternatively, you can uh, use uh, the, uh, this useful formula in uh, Jackson to uh, measure the local spin density when your order parameter changes spatially. So at uh, domain walls, uh, you should be able to see a um, if it is a straight domain wall, you can see spin density if uh, the system has a portable order. If uh, the domain wall has uh, some uh, wiggling, then you should see spin densities at uh, where uh, the domain wall changes its uh, direction. Uh, that's uh, due to the uh, optical order. Uh, these can, in principle, be measured by some local uh, magnetic field probes. So with that, I think I will end my talk, sorry for going over time, but uh, uh, hopefully you can think about uh, multiple moments in uh, in complex magnetic systems in a more serious manner, and probably there's something interesting that you can um, uh, look into either theoretically or experimentally.
I would like I have one question. This is some relationship between the magnetic multiple moments, magnetic with the all solid effect, or the spin hole effect. It's uh, uh, hard to say. So, for example, people um, uh, imagine that the orbital magnetization is related to the intrinsic part of the anomalous Hall effect through the strata formula. Right? But uh, it, you cannot really change the chemical potential uh, easily. So you, this, uh, this connection is uh, very, uh, I mean, it's beautiful theoretically, but uh, it's not of much use in, in practice. In the, uh, in the case of uh, uh, spin hole effect, people, um, I think there was a paper around 2000 talking about the definition of uh, spin hole connectivity, or the intrinsic some sense, spin hole connectivity as a, a response of a, a spin analog of the orbital magnetization to chemical potential, a, a spin, a counterpart of the strata formula. Uh, that's also beautiful theoretically, but uh, in practice, it's uh, um, you cannot really uh, measure, define spin hole effect in that method. So, and most of the time, there's no direct uh, connection. But by symmetry, so by symmetry, there should be present uh, multiple magnetic moment and anomalous hole. Yeah, yeah. Symmetry can allow you to talk about a, a existence. Not so in this formula that I pointed out, you have set three indices moving around. In my head, it looks like the the curvature non abelian tensor of the F matrix coupled with P. Yeah, yeah, some, something like that. So what what is the logic behind? So you you, you take the, the whole curvature tensor and then couple it with the spin and then that's what you integrate. So what what is? Yeah, so eventually it's. Uh, uh, some uh, yeah, massaging uh, as alpha or beta or gamma a sandwich in the set of uh, uh, block wave functions and uh, uh, you uh, there will be some very culture that you subtract from this so you can make them uh, well behaved uh, but uh, this uh, R beta will become uh, some by partial uh, beta. Okay, so these acting on other A's will give you something like very curvature, uh, but uh, it's not necessarily always very curvature because uh, there are maybe higher order derivatives on this uh, wave function as well, so that uh, uh, can be reflected into, uh, um, for example, uh, quantum metric or derivative of quantum metric. Derivative of Eric Kovacher, essentially. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I see, I see. It's just I just I saw the other formula when you had it in momentum form. But yeah, so in the end, it's just a, a, a transformation of uh, derivatives of wave functions into uh, cross band uh, matrix elements of velocity and uh, see, see. speed. Thank you.